Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Pastor Michael Fields here on another Wednesday evening to join with you in our Bible study, our weekly Bible study. And certainly the Lord has been blessing us, and I'm so glad to be able to join with you again yet another time to go into the word of the Lord. And remembering that we've been in the series these past weeks on holiness. Holiness is still right. And tonight we'll get into part six of our series. I've been enjoying it. Don't know about you, but I have been enjoying talking to you about holiness. And tonight we're going to tie in holiness and an aspect of holiness that deals with, of course, growing uh, into Christ likeness. First, let's pray. Father, we love you so much and we're so grateful for yet another opportunity another privilege to come together with your people in the word of God. We ask, O oh God, that you'd bless us through and through everyone that connects with the class on tonight. Give them a special blessing, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, remembering where we left off last week, uh, we were talking about repentance, uh, living a life of repentance. Uh, and certainly I enjoyed that session. Uh, and let's remember the following as it relates to repentance, because uh, it is a perfect segue into what we want to talk about on tonight. Remembering what we covered, dealing with living a life of repentance, uh, initial repentance. Remember what we said, it deals with conversion, recurring repentance or living a life of repentance it deals with discipleship. So it doesn't matter uh, what church you're affiliated with. It doesn't matter who your pastor is. God requires holiness. And living a life of repentance helps us stay in that vein of, of concentrating on living upright before the Lord. Also, repentance, remember we covered, it means uh, that I am discerning that I am uh, discerning whatever perversity, anything that is unlike God, any folly or guilt uh, concerning what has been done. And uh, it means that once I've discovered what's been done wrong, I should, I should desire to find forgiveness, abandon the sin, turn, right? That's what repentance is about and live a God-pleasing life from now on, which means I should not turn, only to turn back to. Also, um, in turning, I should have the wherewithal to ask for forgiveness. Don't just get up and never say, Lord, I was wrong. Part of that repentance is making a confession. I was wrong. I should not have done that. And you're dealing with God accordingly coming to his throne boldly, creating me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, blot out my transgressions, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And then I continue to live a life by demonstrating, whether it's by testimony or and confession as first stated, uh, but there should be a changed behavior, changed behavior, uh, a changed behavior. And it also means that I'm leaving it behind. I'm moving forward, even if people insist on reminding me of what I've done. I have made a decision to move forward. Now, um, before we actually dig in, I need to make this point, uh, which means I cannot become like Christ. I cannot be Christ-like without continuously surrendering to the Lord's will. And that may involve repenting, saying I'm sorry, turning away from it. I was wrong. I should not have said that. Uh, so I'm acknowledging through humility, I'm humbling myself before the Lord. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Uh, and I have the wherewithal to say, Lord, without you, I'm nothing. I can't make this journey without you. And I want to continue to develop this relationship with you. And that relationship involves 
trusting and depending on God. Uh, yes. And it means that I, I need to be transparent with God. Don't hide anything from him. And I must obey him. And yes, as for stated, I must live a repentive life before him. Remember, my objective is always to please God. If I do this, according to what we've already covered, then I'll be producing an environment that is conducive for my growth. Here's the segue. It is conducive for my growth and maturity. This is where we are tonight, growing into Christ likeness. And depending upon how much time we have, we'll be talking about spiritual healthiness and growth. We'll take a quick view at uh, the glory of holiness. Yes. And we'll talk a little bit about an unhealthy spiritual growth. Yes. Uh, it is possible to grow in an unhealthy way. And we'll talk about ongoing uh, growth in grace, the discipline of holiness, and we'll touch on applying the principles of holiness. Now, I, I have to tell you uh, that the final part, I'll have to develop that into the next lesson because there's a whole lot. So when I get to applying the principles of holiness, I'll just let you know what those principles are, but we won't actually cover those principles until our next lesson. So now let's go into tonight's lesson, uh, which deals with the fact that holiness is still right and showing us how we should grow gradually into a Christ likeness and remembering uh, now we're in the book of Titus. This is our foundational scripture. And there are three foundational scriptures that we've chosen for tonight. And uh, don't know if we're going to get to all three of the scriptures, but I'll read them for you. Titus chapter two, verses 11 through 14. It reads like this. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purifying unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Second Peter 3 and 18, some of you can quote this one with me. Uh, and here is really where our scripture is going to focus around. It talks about growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. And then uh, our third foundational scripture comes out of Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, and it sounds like this, but we all with open face, beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now let's dig in, shall we? And um, let's talk a little bit about what we're really talking about. And, and by digging deeper, I'm going to need to take you to uh, Third John. Third John, chapter one, verse two. And this is what it says, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosperous. And here we're talking about spiritual healthiness and growth. This is what John writes in this powerful. I read it again. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosperous. And here uh, John talks about uh, 
three kinds of blessings that are in God's will. And I know this scripture is quoted a lot. And a lot of times it's just quoted as it pertains to living prosperous and being prosperous. Uh, but the clincher is even as thy soul prospers. And even Jesus said, what would it profit a man to gain this whole world and lose his soul? So uh, three kinds of blessings, material prosperity, bodily healing and health, and of course, soul salvation, bodily healing and health, material prosperity. Yes, material prosperity, second Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man according as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, I read that scripture, of course, because even my material prosperity, if I'm a part of the kingdom, it's based upon how much I am willing to release. Yeah. Uh, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And my reaping is not always uh, according to my imagination, which means if I plan a million dollars, it doesn't mean that God's going to give me three million dollars back. So I don't want you to attach materialistic things to everything as it applies to how you should live in the kingdom. I'll stop messing with you now, but the three kinds of blessings, material, yes, bodily healing and health. He promises that he would heal me. Uh, let's, let's read the scripture that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet saying himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Now, um, and that's a powerful verse within itself that I just read, Matthew 8 and 17, and he promises us that he would heal us. Uh, but the most important thing, because what, what if, uh, like Paul, I went to you three times, Lord, uh, concerning this infirmity, this, this thorn in my flesh, and the Lord spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient for thee. What if God is using what you're going through as a means of developing you and making you stronger? And what if you get total and complete healing for your body and never get your soul right? Hmm. What if? So I'm, I'm perfectly healed, but I never make it into glory. So the most important thing, yes, uh, I can I can quickly say it's not God's will that I be uh, broke and disgusted and eating out of garbage cans. Uh, but if, if I'm in that situation and it is more important for me that my soul be right with God. And I know some of you are cringing. What are you talking about feels? What I'm trying to do is get us not to get so attached to cars and, and houses until we forget that holiness is the most important thing, what my soul is like, my soul, my soul salvation, my soul salvation is the most important thing. What's going on? Uh, am I living according to the gospel of Christ? Am I, am I feeding on his word? Am I feasting on his word? Am I living a life that God can be pleased with? And those are those are powerful questions. Those are some questions that we really should be asking us um, because the most important thing to me should be my salvation, the condition of my soul. All right, I'm going to get off of that because I know uh, some of you are looking at me crazy right now because you, of course, and, and I'll raise my hand. Yes, I'd like a big house. Yes, uh, I like fancy cars. But if my soul is not right, if I'm not holy before God, I have a much bigger problem to deal with because none of the things that I forementioned, I can take with me into glory. No, nope. the only thing really that is of the most importance is the condition of my soul. So while bodily wellness uh, and while what's in my pocket, yes, may be important. 
uh, the wellness of my soul is the most important thing. So uh, I might add then that while I'm thinking about it, uh, the most, uh, well, let me say it this way. Uh, another aspect of my spiritual health uh, is constant growth and moral and spiritual dimensions of Christ likeness. And we, we sort of hit on this last week. Um, and I'll say it again. Another aspect of spiritual health is a constant growth. I should be growing constantly, growing. Uh, and I'm growing in moral and spiritual dimensions. I'm growing morally and spiritually, right, uh, into Christ's likeness. Uh, 1 Peter 2 and 2. 1 Peter 2 and 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow. Why should I desire the sincere milk of the word? So I can grow. 2 Peter 3, 18. Peter says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So there should be growth. Yes, uh, a spiritual healthiness and growth. I should be matriculating is the word. I should be advancing. I should be growing uh, just like a baby grows, right? Uh, and their healthiness is based upon what they eat, how they eat, how often they eat, uh, how much exercise they get. And it's the same way spiritually. We have to eat well. Uh, we have to exercise uh, within the kingdom principles that God has laid upon us. Uh, and it develops strength. It develops um, moral strength, spiritual strength. And we become like our Father. So let's view uh, the glory of holiness, the glory of holiness. And I love this uh, particular part of the lesson because uh, one reason, one reason for what appears to be a blindness towards holiness, one reason, it, it's like a blindness. People, people even get upset when you talk about the holiness of God. Um, I think it's, it's because we have so many partial views of what holiness is about. Um, so many different concepts and even beliefs and even teachings about what holiness is all about. So many things, um, so many articles. I've, I've read books and articles from, from theologians, um, old, uh, old school and new school, I would say. When I say old school, I would say uh, 16, 17, 18th century theologians and even uh, Bible scholars and theologians of this day. And you see where people agree and you see where people disagree. And sometimes where we disagree, the disagreement comes when men and women throw in their own ideas or their own beliefs and let me let me say this is not just beliefs, it's opinions. Uh, and and when you become opinionated and start judging the word instead of taking God's word for its value, you'll come up with a whole lot of different things that say really things that are not pertaining to what God is really trying to let us know. We have to be holy because he is holy. Don't judge it. Don't question it. Uh, just do what God tells you to do. And I know that's a tall order because we're grown. We have our own uh, beliefs. We want to do it our way. And uh, But if we want to make it into glory, we really have to do it God's way. So let's continue viewing the glory of holiness. Um, there is a theologian by the name of uh, J.A. Uh, Machir, who gives us a version, or I should say a formula uh, of holiness. And this is what he says as it pertains to uh, viewing the holiness or the glory of holiness. Uh, J.A. Martyr says, uh, holiness is God's hidden glory and glory is God's all present holiness. Uh, and 
uh, Matthew reading the book of Isaiah. Uh, he develops this formula where he says, and I'll say it again, holiness is God's hidden glory and glory is God's all present holiness. Uh, and I have in my notes, listen to this. It's a striking formulation that wonderfully highlights a regular identification or link between the concept of holiness and glory in scripture. Uh, and the scripture uh, that Matra uses uh, comes out of Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. And it talks about this. When Moses says to Aaron, this is it that the Lord spake saying, I will sanctify or I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Hmm. I'll read it again. Moses said unto Aaron, this is that that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them. In them, meaning the people, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And then Aaron held his peace. I'm going to take you to Isaiah chapter six now. Verse three. It says, and one cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So uh, let me say this, and I have in my notes. So when you begin to read around uh, Isaiah chapter six, verse three, uh, you see it pop up a lot in, in, in his writings. Uh, and here is another theologian by the name of Kayser, who says um, he does this uh, and he says this, I'm sorry, holiness is his concealed glory. Holiness is God's concealed glory, but his glory is his holiness revealed. And listen, even Paul picked it up and said the righteousness of God or the holiness of God is revealed through us, through the lives that we live. So the concept is the same in the Old Testament where Moses speaks to Aaron concerning the people when God speaks and says, and I'll read it again. He says these words, uh, this is that the Lord speaks saying, I will sanctify them, meaning the people that come nigh me. Those who come nigh me, I'll sanctify them. Those who come nigh me, meaning those who obey me, those who follow me. Those who want a relationship with me, I will sanctify them. So let's get into this uh, because the Bible says, and we started out the series, be ye holy for I am holy. So let's talk further. Uh, the holiness of God, right? It is often mentioned, but rarely is it understood. And I think it's because of all of these partial views, all of these different concepts and opinions. And sometimes, yes, it sounds good. It sounds deep. But at the end of the day, a lot of times uh, it tends to be, how can I put it? Uh, I won't call it a shortcut, but I'll say a deviation from what God really meant when he said, be holy. Sometimes it's just a long dissertation of how to get closer to man. Uh, sometimes it's just a long drawn out essay on how to get further away from God and do your own thing. And it does not tie you into the will or the intention of God. The intention is for us to be closer to him, to be like him, and eventually one day to be with him. My God, I felt that in my spirit. So let's let's go directly to what the connection is between holiness and the glory of God. What is the connection between holiness and the glory of God? Let's go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. Beautiful illustration here. Uh, and I'll begin at verse 18. Uh, and this is between Moses and and Jehovah, Moses and God. And he said, I beseech ye, remember when Moses is on the mountain and the Lord is saying, Lord, show me your glory. 
Lord, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. This is God talking back to Moses. I'm going to make all of my goodness, all of my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face. You can't see my face, but there shall no man see me and live. I'm too much for your flesh to handle. If you see my face now, you'll fall apart and die. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and thou shalt stand upon a rock and it shall come to pass while my glory passes by that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. That's powerful. I want to take you further down to chapter 34, verses beginning at verse 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down. Now Moses has, has been in the presence of the Lord. He couldn't see God's face. He would have died. But God said, I'm going to let my goodness pass by and you'll see my hinder parts. Now, this is after Moses in the presence of the Lord. He, he gets to rest or abide in the glory of the Lord. He's coming back down amongst the people now. It came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in Moses' hands, when he came down from the mount that Moses was not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. He didn't know that the glory of the Lord was making his countenance brighter and his skin was glowing. And when Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, Behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come next to him. Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them a commandment, all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Till Moses had done speaking with them, he had to put a, a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. He came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. Commanded, I'm sorry. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. Let's talk about this a little bit. Yes, because we're going to talk about the, the relationship, uh, the connection between holiness and the glory of God. So understand an integral part of the reason God couldn't show Moses of the fullness of his glory is the intimate connection between God's holiness and his glory. If I put this simply, it means God's glory in his holiness uh, was going public. Now God's glory and his holiness is going public. That's why we read uh, chapter 10 of Leviticus. Moses says to Aaron, this is that the Lord spake saying, I will sanctify, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. So uh, to those who are near me, I'll read it in another version. For those who are near me, I will show myself holy. And before all the people, I will be glorified. So see the connection between holiness and glorification. When God's holiness is displayed, when God's holiness is displayed, glorification is necessary. Or I should say it's a necessary consequence. So this is where, um, so to speak, the rubber meets the road uh, in to answer uh, our questions about what we're talking about. If God's holiness is infinite, listen, if God's holiness is infinite, then it means that his glory is infinite also. So I can't just release uh, infinite glory of God in a sinful and broken and fragile human body. I, I can't do it within myself because it's too much 
I can't really handle the glory of God in my sinful self. It will have perilous consequences because God's glory and his holiness. Remember these words, my God is a consuming fire. So if God had shown his glory and his fullness, Moses would have been destroyed. He would have been disintegrated. So vision after vision uh, from the prophets and uh, even uh, the, the preachers of, of uh, the New Testament, right? They, they talk about seeing the glory of God. And uh, whenever God, God's glory appeared, they would cover their face because it, it was too much for them too much for them to look at, even too much for them to understand. I can't even understand what I'm looking at. This is why uh, when Isaiah was in the glory of the Lord, he, he gets, uh, I saw the Lord, he was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Remember what Isaiah says uh, in Isaiah six and five, uh, Isaiah said, I said, woe is me for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. So when we understand, listen, this this is where I'm coming to. If we really understand the holiness of God, then you will really understand you and I will really understand just how unworthy we really are. And our bodies aren't even able to handle the fullness of of his glory. No. Hallelujah. We're not able to see the fullness of the sun, right? We, we enjoy the heat and the brightness of the sun, uh, but we can really, we really, if we got too close to the sun, if we were able to get face to face with the sun, uh, we would, we would no longer exist. No. Uh, and it's not because the sun is so bad but it's really because the sun is so great. It's the same way as it pertains to my God. We're not about to see the fullness of the glory of God in our current state. No, but one day, oh, I feel God right here. One day we will be able to see him face to face, but I can't do it now, but I'm on my way. This path of holiness is, is bringing me to a place where one day I can see him face to face to face, right? And we're not about to see him in his fullness right now because we can't, we can't handle it in our present state. And it, it's not because God is so bad, but it's because he is so glorious. So in the meanwhile, his glory is revealed through the life that we live. Just like, uh, and I have in my notes, listen to this, just because we don't get to see the backside of the glory of God like Moses, it doesn't mean that we don't get to see his glory. God's glory is displayed everywhere, whether it's potential or already actualized, whether it's seen in worship. Yeah, whether it's seen in worship or in the incredible beauty of nature, right? Right. One who graciously puts air in our lungs, right? One who gives us life every day, everything, even the very universe, even the very universe itself and the very rocks of earth will praise his name and proclaim his glory. This is what Habakkuk says in uh, chapter two, verse 14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, my God, as the waters cover the sea. Here's another verse I want to bring you to. I'm going to take you back to Leviticus, and it's in chapter 11. He says, for I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall, be, shall ye rather defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Yes, consecrate yourselves and be holy. And of course, uh, I can't do anything perfectly. I'm, I'm still in this flesh. So we can't be perfectly holy like God, but we can strive. We can strive. We can strive to be like him. Uh, when we live a life that is set apart unto God, 
Yes, striving to live our lives in moral purity, just like Christ did. And we do that through the leading and the unction of the Holy Spirit. I can't do it on my own. Say it with me. I can't do it on my own. This is why you need the Holy Ghost. This is why you need the Holy Ghost, right? While we're taking this journey, uh, we are growing. We are developing. Yes, uh, we are growing. We are developing. Say it with me. I'm growing and I am developing and I'm spending time with the Lord, listening to his voice, spending time in his presence. And I'm desiring to get close to him. And those that get close to him, he'll sanctify them. He'll purify them. He'll strengthen them. So there's an ongoing growth, uh, child of God. Let's go to 2 Peter 3.18. 2 Peter 3.18. And, and this is Peter talking to us, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So then, uh, while I'm growing in grace, while I'm developing a knowledge of him, that, that's an experience, that's life experience. And as I live this life, I'm learning more and more about him. And I'm developing a desire to be more and more like my God. But I have to be careful because if, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, if I don't develop uh, a desire. Remember in, the, in one of our lessons, we talked about desire to live before him. I can become unhealthy spiritually. I can become just, just, just like in the natural, if I don't eat proper, if I continue to eat the wrong things, I can become unhealthy. And let's, let's talk about some things that will hinder my spiritual growth. Some things, and, and we'll, because we'll, I don't want to keep you too long, but there are things that can hinder me, right? Uh, things that can pull me away, that can stunt my growth, even kill me. The first thing, the first thing that hinders spiritual growth or can help develop an unhealthy spirit, or I'll even say a bad spirit, distractions and desire. Remember what we talked about in our previous lessons about having a desire for God. Uh, and our desire has a great deal to do with whether we will grow in spiritual maturity or not. So we have to be careful of distractions and desire. Hmm. And as amazing as, as this might sound, we are the ones, we are the ones that determine our level of hunger and desire. You determine how, how hungry or how uh, determined you are. Uh, you can't really put it on anyone else. You determine that. Uh, so you have to be careful of distractions and desire. Yes. The second thing that hinders is sin. There goes that three letter word that the saints don't really like to talk about. Uh, but remember, God is holy and without any kind of shadow of, of darkness. There's no in between with God. Uh, we're either in or out, holy or unholy. Uh, so he cannot come near to a sinful humanity without the atoning sacrifices. Jesus made with his life. What are you saying, Fields? Well, uh, right now there's a song, um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I was raised in the church. I came up in the 60s and 70s, and, and it was nothing for the saints to start singing, I'm gonna stay right under the blood. I'm gonna stay right under the blood. I'm gonna stay right under the blood. So the world won't do me no harm. And that harm, it wasn't until after I got saved myself that that harm has to deal with uh, taking away a desire to live right. The world, 
the world is not my home. And uh, so I have to remember that Jesus died for my sins and I don't want to go back to what I've been delivered from. Uh, so what I just said, what does this mean? This means that sin puts a hindering wall between me and God. So I have to stay away from sin. This is why I live a, a life of repentance, because I don't want anything in between me and living holy. And there are all kinds of sins. Yes, but all unrighteousness. Let's say it like this. All unrighteousness is sin. Uh huh. So I need God in my life. I need his life giving presence in order for me to grow in faith and in love. And I have an understanding that if I indulge in sin, it will hinder my spiritual growth. It'll kill me because the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. The next thing that hinders our spiritual growth, child of God, is negative thinking. Mm -hmm. Negative thinking. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Child of God, think on these things, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of a good report. Stop being so negative. Where is your faith? How can I, how can I make it if all I do is think contrary to God's word? If God says yes, and I'm constantly saying no, 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 think positive. Negative thinking hinders your spiritual growth. Negative thoughts are void of faith. I'm going to say it again. Negative thoughts are void of faith. There's no faith in that negativity. The just shall live by faith. Yes. Now, the next thing is certain relationships can hinder your spiritual growth. Certain relationships are getting in the way of you living a holy life. Yes. Uh, if you read in the book of Psalms, the very first Psalm says that successful people do not get tangled up with negative, wicked, or limiting people. Yes, limiting people are people who always have something negative to say about your positive direction. They are negative influence on your desire to please God or even do things to better yourself. But listen to this. I'm going to read my notes again. The first psalm, the very first psalm in the book of Psalms says that, I, that successful people do not get tangled up with negative, wicked, or limiting people. But successful people, they delight themselves in God's word. They delight themselves in God's word. So some of our relationships are hindering us. Some of the people we call friends, some of the people that we continue to be around and, you know, they're not a good influence as it relates to your walk with God and you keep hanging around them. Right. Um, yes. And here I'm going to read something out of the book of Psalms, uh, Psalms. 119 and 63, it says, I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. I'm a companion. These are my friends. These are my friends, those that reverence you, Lord. That's the kind of friend I want. That's the kind of relationship I want. I want to be around people that love the Lord and have a reverence for God and want to be better, just like I want to be better, right? and those who keep your precepts. The next thing that hinders our spiritual growth is judgmental attitudes. A judgmental attitude can hinder your spiritual growth. I have in my notes, judgmental attitudes severely limit spiritual growth. Uh, and sometimes this attitude creeps into our minds subtly. Uh, yeah. And, and judgmental attitudes are in our lives more than we think. And once you start honestly looking for this in your own life, you'll see it everywhere. For example, um, 
Have you ever looked at somebody, just looked at them and judged them according to their appearance? I'm going to tell you something true. Um, I'm, I'm a little older now, but I started out working as um, a national evangelist one time in my 20s. Bishop Bonner would send me all over the country. Um, and this particular time, I'm all the way on the West Coast. And one thing, one thing I found out about the West Coast, it, it can be a parts of our country that if you when you go there, it's like a different world. It's, it's just that way. Um, and but the Bible says I have sheep that you don't even know, folds that you're not even aware of. And I was preaching in this church. Um, and because the way I, were, I was raised, I was never in the church uh, before this time that had different kinds of people, different colors of people, different uh, nationalities. And uh, a young lady came up who didn't look like I was used to looking at, you know, um, her appearance was different. She was dressed differently. And in my environment, uh, the dress has to be a certain length. Uh, she had open toe shoes. In my environment, the toes couldn't be out. She had no sleeves on her arms. And in the environment I was raised, you're not saved if you don't have your arms and not covered, right? And I judged her. And instead of asking, what did you want God, what do you want God to do? I asked her, uh, do you have the Holy Ghost? Are you saved? Would you like to be baptized? And she looked at me like I was crazy. What do you mean? Yes, I'm saved. She said, yes, sir. She was polite. but She let me know I have the Holy Ghost. But something was checked inside of me because the only reason why I asked her if she was saved was because of how she looked. And that really got me. I said, and I had to repent before God. I said, Lord, I have no right to judge people. I didn't take time to discern. Uh, I, I re, and I'm running a prayer line. So I had to I had to stop being spiritual. And I became judgmental. And that's that's a word right there. Uh, and I know uh, there there was a part of being discerning that I am judging, but I'm not talking about that judge kind of judgment. I judged her simply because of how she looked. And that's wrong. That's wrong. Uh, that's wrong. So listen, and I wrote it in my notes, when we don't understand a person's situation, actions or choices, uh, we may speak despairing words. And, and some of us really, we look at other brothers and sisters in the house uh, and you don't know what they're going through. You don't know what's happening in their life. You don't know what they have to go home to. And you start judging. You don't know their circumstances or the intent of their heart. Man looks on the outside. This is why in one lesson I said we, we can't just base holiness on taking the earrings out and lengthening the dress. You have to start holiness from the inside. From the inside. And sometimes Born again believers are, are the worst with this because you don't even try to understand the mindset of other people. And Jesus didn't conduct himself like that. No. So we have to take time to understand uh, because when we pass judgment on others, and a lot of us do, and we don't try to understand a person's uh, mindset, it, it, can, it can produce a boomerang effect. It leaves your own life open for what I call a boomerang effect. Listen, uh, for what, for in that which you judge another, Paul said, you condemn yourself. Mm -hmm. So that judgment is like throwing a boomerang. When you judge another person in an area, uh, that same judgment is going to come back to you. Hmm. And sometimes we don't see what's in us. And, and this is what where it stunts your growth. You're so busy looking at the faults in other people's lives until you're blind to the mess in your own life. So you want them to clean up, but you don't take time to clean up yourself. 
You want them to clean out their backyard, but you don't see all that stuff in your own backyard. And that's where you stunt your growth. So it's like a continual cycle, a continual cycle that prevents your growth. Uh, hmm. And what it should do, what 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 you should be doing is saying, Lord, if you see anything in me that shouldn't be, take it away. Take it away. Uh, now, uh, another thing that stunts our, our spiritual growth and keeps us really from from walking in holiness as we should is an unhealthy submission to religion. I'm going to say it again. And I'm not trying to offend anyone uh, because the Bible talks about good religion. I'm talking about when I say religion, I'm talking about the rudiments of men, man made stuff. And it's an unhealthy submission to it. Right. Because there are people, you know, everything the pastor says, the pastor says, sit there. The pastor said, wear this. And if all you know is what the pastor put in writing and you don't know anything about what God has put in writing, there is a problem. That's an unhealthy growth. What happens when the man puts something in writing that is totally outside of what God has put in writing? What if what man says contradicts with the holiness of God and you follow man? No. Nope. You should, if you want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, if you want to be more like Christ, right? I don't want to be man-made. I want to be God-made. And holiness is unto God. So there is an unhealthy submission to religion. Uh, and this takes place. This happens when the church becomes God. This, and this is deep. This is a lesson within itself. This, this problem comes when the church becomes your God. The church takes God's place. Um, where, where the church morphs into what is commonly called legalism, where the church is no longer spiritual or spirit led and it just deals with rules and regulations. Do this, do that, do that. And there's no scripture basis there's there's nothing but legalism. Uh, and this is wrong. The only thing that saves you is God's grace by faith alone. You're loved and valued by your Lord because you are his child. It has nothing to do with. Uh, and, and here here is a marker. Here is a marker. When when you are a member of a church that says we're the only ones living right. Ain't nobody else holy but us. That's a lie. That's not true. I, I had a conversation years ago with a young man. I won't mention his name or the church he belongs to. Uh, and his conversation to me went something like this. He said, um, I, I enjoyed your message. And, and it sounds a little bit like what I hear at my church, uh, and you know, uh, and we're on our way to heaven. Ain't nobody else saved but us. And and those were his words to me. And I I didn't even respond. I just I just looked at him, um, and I I thought about it, and 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 no insult intended, but the church that he belonged to only had about ten to twelve members. And I thought about it when I got to my hotel room, um, how his conversation went with me. We're the only ones that are going to heaven. And, you know, he had some more things to say because we're holy and ain't nobody else right. And I see all these other churches, da, 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 you know. Um, but the thought came to me, if he's telling me the truth and um, only 12 people are going to make it to heaven. And maybe not all the 12 of the 12. And, and the Bible says that he has sheep that we don't even know. Other folds uh, we're not even aware of. We're not the only ones living holy. Don't ever fall into that trap. God has many children. Children you don't even know. People, children that don't speak your language. Children that don't dress like you. 
children that don't have the same culture you have, but they have the Holy Ghost just like you have. And they need to be holy just like you need to be holy as well. You don't find holiness in your garment. Render your heart, not your garment. And I'm not fighting doctrine. Please don't misunderstand me. Doctrine is necessary. Yes. And if we but if we're right inside, you don't have to worry so much about what's going on outside. The last thing I want to uh, bring out um, that can hinder my spiritual growth is a fear of change. Um, th- did you ever have a desire to do something? And, and I'd say a desire, something God put in you uh, that he wanted you to do. Um, and it's outside of your comfort zone something he wanted you to start, but it's outside of your comfort zone. And that that means that you would have to start making some changes and immediately uh, things would change around you. Perhaps even uh, certain people that you considered friends, they may not even want to be friends with you anymore, but the Lord is leading you there. Uh, And if you make this change, if you do what the Lord is saying, you will grow, you'll mature, you'll learn some things about God that you didn't know before. You may even learn some things about yourself. Find some things about yourself. And you'll be able to say, uh, why do you think Paul was able to say, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me? He didn't get there overnight. But because you are afraid of this, uh, it's it's so hard for you to step out of your comfort zone, right? Um, The hardest part is always the first part. Just taking that step, just taking that step. Uh, Getting close to God is a change, right? Because the the closer you get to God, uh, and there's some people may be offended because you're you're doing your best to please God and you cannot please man and God at the same time. Uh, And fear will come and attempt to hinder you until you conquer that fear. I have not given you the spirit of fear, but I've given you power, love and a sound mind. So you got to take perhaps take small steps at first. I'm helping somebody. You may have to take small steps at first, uh, but just take those small steps. And and after a while, those steps, those little steps will become bigger steps. And you'll find yourself walking in the way that God wants you to walk, in the direction that God wants you to walk. And remember his word, the steps of a good man, you finish, are ordered by the Lord. So as we begin to grow in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, um, your roots, uh, mm -hmm, your roots will have uh, or need, I should say, your roots will need a, a more space to grow. You ever see a small plant? Uh, and when whoever owns that plant realizes that if this plant is going to ever get to its fullest potential, I have to, I have to repot the plant. I have to, and I talked about that in my, in my sermon Sunday. There's a there's a planting, and then there's a replanting where he takes you out of a smaller pot and puts you in a larger pot. Sometimes. Uh, the person that owns that plant takes you out of the pot, that plant out the pot, right into the ground. You're ready. You're ready for more space. So your roots can grow. And a lot of times uh, we're so afraid of change and the enemy smacks us with fear because the devil knows if God takes you out of that pot and puts you in the ground, gives you a gives you more space and where and a lot of times we are afraid to come out that pot but if the god can get you in that place your roots will spread out and you'll grow to your fullest potential that's what the enemy is trying to do by smacking you with fear but the devil is a liar you shall be a tree planted like a tree planted by the rivers of water hallelujah your leaves shall prosper. That's what God wants to put you. And that tree that he's planting, he wants it to be a holy tree. Hallelujah. I feel like I feel like preaching right here. I feel like preaching right here. So we continue to grow. 
We continue to grow. Say it with me. I'm going to continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm hastening on because I, I, I'm trying to be mindful of the fact that I've been holding you for over an hour every week. Uh, forgive me for doing that, but I miss you all so much. I, I can't see you face to face. So while I have you, I'm trying to hold you um, and I'm trying to do better. So let's let's talk about the fact that there is a discipline to holiness, right? I'm growing, I'm developing, uh, and there are times where God will attempt to pull me out of the pot and I can't be afraid of God moving in my life because there is a progression in holiness. Holy people, as we move along, God has better things, higher heights. My grandmother used to say higher heights and deeper depths in the Lord. Uh, and there was an old lady in the church that said to me one time, but in higher levels mean higher devils. Uh, but it's a good sign as you increase and develop in developing God. And as you become more like Christ, as the enemy fights you. Uh, the Lord continues to develop. You continue to grow. You continue to mature. You continue to mature. So don't be afraid. I don't know who I'm talking to. Don't be afraid. And as we grow, we also learn that there has to be a discipline. There is a discipline to living holy. There is a discipline to living holy. Say it with me. There is a discipline of holiness. Yes. And I know that we live in a lax, uh, soft, uh, lackadaisical atmosphere and environment where anything goes right. Uh, we're living in a day where people don't like discipline, uh, right? And, uh, you know, you always hear all oh, the millennials, this, the millennial. It's not just the millennials. It's some of you old timers, too, that don't want to be disciplined. Nobody can correct you. Uh, but living holy, understand, there's a discipline to that. If we would live holy lives, not for people, but for the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have to know uh, and learn to discipline ourselves, to discipline ourselves. And a discipline like this, it includes a resistance to temptation, uh, to uh, push back an indulgence, and also uh, a control of legitimate powers. Uh, and when I talk about those powers, I'm talking about the powers of my mind. Sometimes you have to talk to your own self and tell yourself it's not right. Uh, and of your body, you have to control. And knowing, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Right. Uh, and this is for several reasons. First, uh, legitimate desires and appetites. If I allow my fleshly desires and appetites to take control, I'll indulge in them so much so uh, until I, I'll become an avenue of a constant avenue of temptation and sin. In other words, if I allow my flesh and my appetites and desires, my lusts to take control, then I'll be consumed by my own flesh. Yes. And I'll start living in that temptation and sin and indulging in that. And the wages of sin is death. So I have to follow Christ. I have to follow Christ. So um, and we talked about a little bit about this in the last lesson. So my desires, my affections have to be set on things above. And I have to learn how to glorify God in my body and have to be able to say no. Say it with me. No. Just like you say no to people, you're going to have to learn how to say no to yourself, no to your flesh, no to the enemy. Resist the devil and he will flee. And you got to and, and truthfully, you got to do a whole lot more than just say no, because even when you say no, like a lot of children, when you say no, you really mean yes. You have to use the word of God. Uh, I don't want to do anything that transgresses against God's will and God's way. Right. What the Bible says, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. And here's the clincher. And you are not your own. 
ye are bought with a price. I belong to Jesus and Jesus belongs to me. So Paul says, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to God. They belong to God. And here Paul says again in Romans chapter 12, verse one, come on, say it with me. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul also says in Romans 6 and 19, I'll say it for you, as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity, mm -hmm, unto iniquity, even so now then yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness, right? Just like you gave yourself in the world, gave yourself over to sin in the world, now that you belong to Jesus, Surrender yourself totally and completely now. Yield your members as servants of righteousness. And here's the clincher. Unto holiness. Unto holiness. That's Romans 6 and 19. Paul says again in, in the book of Colossians chapter 3 verse 17. And whatsoever ye do. In word or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Understanding that we've all been redeemed. I'm a redeemed creature. And whatever I do in word or deed, I want to do it in the name of Jesus. And I want to do it in his name. I want to do it in representation of him under his authority. So whatever I do, I'm doing it under his authority and I'm doing it just like he would do it. And because I'm a representation of him, I'm attached to him. And because he is holy, this is where I'm going. Then I should strive in whatever I'm doing to do it in the way of holiness. Holiness. Now, that information that I just gave you to give proper credit was written by a young lady by the name of Dr. Leslie Wilcox. Uh, she died in 1991, but she was an astute Bible scholar theologian. Yes, she was a female, uh, but she was a Bible teacher and a theologian. Uh, she was a well-known holiness movement theologian. I didn't say she was a pastor. For those of you who are writing your letters now, uh, she was a Bible teacher and a theologian um, and a church administrator. She was a, a secretary in the church, but she was a student of the Bible and her church used her to teach Bible lessons and she served for many years. Um, and, and this is the school, I'll give you the school that she taught at, she's passed now, uh, at God's Bible School in College, it was called. And um, so that information that I just gave you was part of something that she wrote uh, for a pamphlet that's called the Revivalist Press. Um, it was written in 1967. My, my um, my dad passed and uh, going through his stuff, there's a lot of books and pamphlets that he has so old that they're turning brown. Uh, and a lot of, well, I should say all of his books he left to me. There's so many books and writings and stuff. Uh, I'm going to have to buy a new house and get a room just devoted to all of the books that he's left behind. Um, let me close out with this. And I, I want to thank you for your your time and your patience. Um, and, and this deals with applying the principles of holiness. And there's something I want to spend a whole lesson on this. Uh, so, yes, there's going to be a part seven uh, to holiness is still right. And that will be next week. But next week we'll deal with the application of many of the things we talked about. Uh, during this series. How do I apply? Pastor, how do I apply? And, and we need to go here because uh, in our environment, we always hear, don't do, do, uh, stay here, do this. But we, we don't always, and sometimes we never get, how do I do what you just told me? How do I apply? So 
we're going to talk about next week um, seven principles of uh, applying holiness. How do I apply holiness? I know the preacher told me holiness is still right. Uh, and some of us, the only thing we know about holiness is how I should dress, uh, what not to wear, you know. Uh, and holiness is more than that holiness. How, how should I live? So um, seven, seven principles we're going to talk about in, in applying holiness to our lives. And I'm going to give you those seven principles and we'll actually teach those principles in our final part of the series. Unless God tells me there's going to be a part eight. Uh, but here we go um, and write these down applying the principles of holiness, and we're going to teach this next week, but um, know and love the word of God. That's number one. Know and love the word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Know and love the word of God. Number two, consider yourself dead to sin and alive in Christ. That's the second principle. First principle, know and love the word of God. Know and love the word of God. Second principle, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive in Christ. The third principle, strive. And this is what we talked about last week. Strive for a daily repentance before God. And I know it's controversial because there are people who feel like I uh, I'm already saved. I don't need to say sorry or repent for nothing else that I do. That ain't true. So the third principle is strive for daily repentance before God. The fourth principle, the third was strive for daily repentance before God. The fourth principle, I'm going to cultivate, I'm going to cultivate holiness through prayer and work and we're going to we're going to discuss that right because the bible talks about good works that they may see your good works and when they see your good works they'll glorify your father which is in heaven so we're, we're going to talk about cultivating this holiness through prayer a life of prayer and works mm -hmm. the fifth principle is flee from worldliness Flee from worldliness. Flee from worldliness. The six deals with, I'm going to seek fellowship in the church. I'm going to seek fellowship in the church. That's number six. And the last one, number seven, commit completely to God. I'm going to commit completely to God. I'm going to stop here. Um, I'm going to stop here and I've been enjoying uh, these segments on holiness and uh, holiness is still right. And I'm not just supposed to say I'm holy, but I'm supposed to live a holy life and grow in it, develop, mature, grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. My experience with this holy God should allow me and help me to become more like him, deeper into holiness. Yes, deeper into hope because he is holy. And there are things that can prevent me from maturing. And if I get tangled up in those, I'll, I can become an unhealthy spiritual brain. But if I do it God's way, I'll become mature. I'll become strong and healthy in my spirit, man. And though the outward man perish, I can be renewed day by day. And there are disciplines in holiness that I must follow. I have to, I have to become a disciplined individual. Prayer and fasting and reading God's word. Yes. And in doing this, I understand that there is an application, things that I must do daily, things that I must be consistent. And those things, of course, I'm going to break down in more detail in our next lesson. 
But I want to pray for you now, those of you who have been watching and those of you who desire a closer walk with God. Yes, sometimes the altar call is for the saints, not not for those who don't know the Lord. But sometimes the altar call needs to be for just the saints. Time for us to get closer. Time for us to make our calling and election sure. Time for us to make a decision about holiness because holiness without no man shall see the Lord. Holiness without mixing it with anything else because if I mix it with anything else, it's no longer holiness. Only what Christ wants, only what God desires, only what God determines. Holiness is still right. And if I live right, if I do it according to his word, I'll, I'll resemble him. I'll resemble him. I'll walk in his likeness. I'll be a holy person striving to become stronger and more like him. And I can't, I can't handle all of his glory now, not in this flesh, because there's no good thing in my flesh. But if I walk in the way of holiness one day, I'll be able to see him face to face. Moses was not able to see God face to face. But if I live right, because of what Christ has done, if I walk in this way of holiness, I'll be able to do what Moses could not do on Mount Sinai. Oh, to behold his face. Listen, there's a song right now. I'm getting ready to pray. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face and to sing forever of his saving grace. And on the streets of glory, I'm going to lift my voice. Cares are past, home at last, ever to rejoice. And I've got to stay holy. I've got to walk upright so I can see him face to face. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we thank you for your word today. We want to be like you. We want to grow, Hasha, as your children and walk before you as your sons and daughters. We thank you for your way of holiness. We thank you for the beauty of holiness. And we thank you for the glory that is revealed through our lives. We thank you that although we can't see you face to face, we can only get glimpses of your glory. Although your glory is revealed through the life that we live, we know that if we stay in the way, if we stay in the way of truth, if we stay in the way of holiness, one day we will see you face to face. Hallelujah. And this is what my soul longs for, to see your face. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, um, if you would like to plant a seed in this ministry, if you haven't been able to pay your tithes over the weekend, you want to do it now, Brother Craig will put that on the screen for you and uh, be giving you instructions on how you can plant that seed. Those of you, of course, who are watching us from our sister church, Refuge Temple Annex in the Bronx, you may use Givelify. Thank you so much for spending time with me. And don't forget, meet me next week. We will be dealing with the application of certain principles. How do I apply the principles of holiness to my life? The Lord bless you and keep you. Be safe, be prayerful, and be holy. <laughs>